From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up, K-State's David Cook is joined by Blake Beckstein of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency within the U.S. Department of Defense, which is supporting David's research into plant genetic resistance to viruses. This is part of DARPA's nationwide agricultural biosecurity initiative. Then, another segment from the weekly Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State. This time, K-State's Brad White, Bob Larson, and Bob Weber discuss cow body condition scoring and nutrient testing of harvested forages. And later, K-State's Charlie Lee will talk about the nature of copperhead snakes and a new study of their predatory tactics. All this and more here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and in the guest chair now, a couple of individuals who are involved in research here at K-State, and one is being supported by the other, to put it that way, we'll explain. Joining us now is a K-State plant pathologist, David Cook, and a special guest. He is from the Department of Defense and involved with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, under the DOD. Blake Beckstein is his name. Blake, welcome to you, first of all. Appreciate you being here with us. Thank you. Happy to be here. Let's talk a bit about this program that the Department of Defense supports, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Give the layperson out there an idea of what that is. So the the backstory really is that in 1958, when Sputnik went up, the Department of Defense and the U.S. government decided that we don't want to be surprised by any potential adversaries, uh, not surprised by technological advances. So put in place our agency, originally it was ARPA and then now DARPA with the D in front of it for defense. The whole focus was to make sure that we are the leaders in technological advancement that lead to a more secure uh, nation. And therefore, the interaction with the scientific community. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, we've been involved in some pretty big ticket things, uh, the internet, GPS technology that everybody has in their phones right now, uh, just to name a, a couple. A couple of uh, lesser known. Right, right, so right. <laughs> you may have seen those before. <laughs> yes, indeed so. Want to ask, what brings you to K-State then under the auspices of the program? Well, as we've sort of gone forward in time, technology has really been hitting us in different areas. And biological technologies is one of those areas that, you know, in the future is going to be very, very important. And so we want to make sure that we are on the leading edge of understanding what those technologies are and also developing the technologies that we can utilize to make sure that we keep ourselves safe. And so in 2014, the Biological Technologies Office stood up, and that was because we at the agency had enough projects and other offices that made sense to stand up and uh, be on uh, on our own. I joined DARPA in 2016, and one of my focuses was going to be or is agricultural biosecurity. And so that's what leads me to, you know, being here at K-State. We have a young faculty research program, and David is actually one of the recipients of an award in that area, and he can tell you a little bit more about his research. But the idea is we want to be ahead in technology. And one of the reasons for being involved in agricultural projects is uh, obviously, I mean, your audience is going to know very well the importance of agriculture to the stability of our economy. And so we want to make sure that we protect that infrastructure from harm, either from you know adversarial impacts or from natural conditions that, that change and, and really alter agricultural production. So that's why I'm here. And I, I'm here checking on him to make sure, <laughs> you know, that he's doing great work. And he is. The uh, last two days have been fantastic. We've gotten to see uh, and hear everything that they're doing. And 
Uh, I can tell you that K-State has top-notch agricultural capabilities uh, in the molecular space and attracting faculty, especially young faculty like David, to a place like K-State. K-State's doing what they should be doing to help bring those resources here to your state. Great to hear. David, we do want to bring you in. Talk a bit about what you're involved with research-wise in plant pathology here at Case. Okay, well, thanks for having me over. Um, As a faculty member in the plant pathology department, we're interested in how do plants get sick, understanding that process, and then how can we intervene? How can we, you know, help plants stay healthier in the field? They get sick just like you or I would. Um, So, you know, we're, we're plant doctors out there. And my interactions with DARPA and with Blake's team came about through a call they had looking for a new technology, a new advancement. You know, can we do something different to help intervene and and make the plant immune system stronger? Um, And so this is what we've been working on for the last year, um, trying to introduce a new um, system having to do with gene editing, but we're actually going after a different molecule. And we think that this can be really important for helping protect plants, really specifically against viruses. And we think sort of as the technology matures and as we push it forward, we can do other capabilities with this technology. But that's our main focus right now is, is can we make plants more resistant to viruses as these limit production and our, our big problems you know, here in Kansas, in U.S., and, and really worldwide. Is your work concentrated on one specific crop? So given that this research and technology is in its infancy, this is really, you know, just building the system up. We're currently working in model plant systems and and with model viruses. Um, So this work is being done in a tobacco relative. It's easy for us to work with in the lab. Um, And we're working with an RNA virus that is a representative of, of many important plant viruses. Your work, though, the hope is that it will translate into other plants common to Kansas agriculture, for instance, and and elsewhere in the country, obviously. Exactly. The the goal is to learn how the system works, learn how we can utilize it, and then get it out into wheat, get it into corn, get it into soybean. There's a lot of steps in between um, what we're doing and and that commercialization. There's obviously plenty of regulatory and de-risking, and that's part of of what DARPA does and, and their interest so it's not going to happen tomorrow, but that is that is certainly where we see this going. It's clear that the support of DARPA and the Department of Defense in general is critical to what you're trying to accomplish then. It's funny. We were talking about this a bit last night. We wouldn't be working on this project without their support. And the agency's significantly different than the other funding streams that we would be able to go after. Yeah, I mean, this project wouldn't be happening without... DARPA getting involved in sort of the ag biosecurity space. And just to follow up on that, DARPA is a mission-focused agency. So we have a goal and we go after it. And we put the resources necessary to be able to do that. So we don't ask people like David to do this on a shoestring budget. We also are flexible. So as technology changes, we want him to take advantage of that. He wrote a grant proposal a year and a half ago. This field moves fast. Things have changed, and we've asked him to be looking at the landscape around him, take advantage of it. But what we're, to get to your point, we absolutely are focusing on getting to a place where what he is doing will benefit agriculture in this state, in this country, and everywhere around the world, hopefully. You know, the more secure our food supply is, uh, the more secure we are. So that's that's sort of one of those big focuses that we have. And just to get a handle on the scope of what the program does, David is but one of many researchers you're interacting with and supporting likewise on various fronts, right? That's right. Yeah, we uh, uh, fund research in uh, universities and companies uh, across the country, uh, also have some international researchers that are involved in some of the programs. So yeah, as a program manager, I have a portfolio. And so, you know, the agricultural biosecurity portion of it is a part of what I do. And so we, yeah, fund uh, quite a few different efforts. In addition, Blake, to plant disease resistance, you look forward. What are some of the other leading challenges in this whole arena that you foresee? Well, I think basic food security, the world constantly gets smaller. 
and the pathogens, the pests, the issues that we're going to have in agriculture continue to increase. And, uh, you know, there's new stuff coming into our country all the time. We have to be poised to protect ourselves against those. And then all the way through sort of that uh, stream of how you get from field to table, there's issues. So within the food we eat, spoilage, other problems like that, you know, we just constantly have these challenges that come along. And so we have to find these platform technologies that uh, are early, high risk, high reward, and put funding in place so that we can make our food supply much safer. And all modesty aside, Kansas State University has become something of an epicenter for that cause, with the National Bio Agro Defense Facility being built, the Biosecurity Research Institute already established here at the university. Efforts such as David has undertaken, uh, there's quite a lot going on here. Absolutely. Yeah, this is definitely a a center of excellence for the future. Mm -hmm. And those two facilities that you just mentioned are poised to really put Kansas in a good position, you know, to be able to do the kind of research that needs to be done. You know, some of these things that, you know, we worry about the main way to prepare ourselves to protect ourselves is to know the pests and pathogens that we're going to deal with. And the facilities that you have uh, on that end of campus, th- that's exactly what they're there to do. And also as a, a faculty member on campus, I mean, we're very interested in research and, and learning new things, but also education. And so, you know, being able to tie in all the research that's going on here, you know, in Kansas and a very agricultural forward state, which should be, you know, a a place of growth for for jobs and industry in in the coming years. You know, I think that's also a really strong point here for Kansas State to to have undergraduates really sort of be at this this front line and, and learning. David, congratulations on the support you're receiving from the department, and we're looking forward to talking with you in the future about your progress in the area. Thank you. I'll be happy to come back. Blake, good to have you here on the campus, and thanks for not only the support at Kansas State University, but sharing a few moments on the background of the program. Thank you very much. Along with David Cook, who is a plant pathologist here at K-State, Blake Beckstein, he is with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, under the U.S. Department of Defense. He's been visiting the campus this week. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll return shortly on the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Ahead for you now on Agriculture Today, topics that were addressed during the latest Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. Each week, the team of BCI specialists gather around the table to tackle current topics in cattle production and management. You'll hear comments this time from cow-calf specialist Bob Weber, veterinarian Bob Larson, and your moderator, veterinarian and director of the BCI, Brad White. As we get to this time of year, we start thinking about different things. One of those is it's almost time to preg check. Some people have already started preg checking. Uh, And a typical thing that we do at at preg check time is work with, as we run in the animals through the cows through, we we may do a body condition score or a a BCS. And Bob Larson, I wanted to turn to you and ask, is it really important to do the BCS at this time of year, a body score on those cows? Yeah, I, I think getting a body condition score on the cows is a, a, an important thing to do for the, this time of year for a couple of reasons. Maybe one of the most important is as we're heading into winter, this is a time, and, and we're weaning the calves, uh, so springborn herd, I'm assuming, uh, weaning calves. So their, their nutrient requirement is not particularly high, but we're leading into the time period of the year where they're going to get the least nutrients from the forage, standing forage. And, and so really knowing where their body condition is today is important to plan that winter nutrition, winter supplementation plan. So, and Bob Weber, I'll, I'll turn to you. 
what do you expect them to be? I mean, if we're, we're weaning calves, won't they likely be thin? Springborn herd, we get to fall, won't they likely be thin? Yeah, I think there's um, maybe a, a variety of expectation. I, I think I agree with Bob Larson that this is a great time of year to body condition score cows, partially because we have them uh, available. We're going to break track. We're the weaning anyway. calves. We have a, a ability to, to collect that. Um, but it's also a good good point in time to plan because if we need to correct body condition score on cows um this sort of end of the second trimester dry cow has a low maintenance requirement we can add a body condition score to that cow um in pretty short order pretty inexpensively if we wait and delay that until a point in time where maybe we have snow on the ground and we're trying to to feed them right in front of calving their late gestation that requirement then goes dramatically up and becomes more 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 expensive so i'm kind of cheap so i like this period of time as a way to inexpensively fix it and give us plenty of time in case we have to do some some serious fixing maybe put two body condition scores on something well, and, and but even this, if you but, had one or two body condition scores to put on between now and calving you've got enough time that the, the average daily gain is low yeah i mean you how, make much them weight, gain a how much weight is so body score scale one to nine one to nine five being kind of medium of that mm-hmm. or in the ideal range so if i have to change from a four to a five how much weight are we talking so it, it's going to depend a little bit on the size of the cattle. But the, the number I usually go with is about 100 pounds. So a little smaller frame cattle will be a little lower. Yep. Maybe bigger frame cattle a little bit more, but about 100 pounds per body condition. So if you've got two body conditions to put on and we've got 120 days, uh, 150 days, something like that, you're not asking those cows to put on a lot of weight per day, and it doesn't have to be a really high uh, cost diet to do that. So I think back to your, your point, Brad, earlier about, well, what, what do we expect? And and given how much drought there was, particularly in eastern Kansas this year, I wouldn't be surprised, There's especially if people haven't weaned yet, some cows that come in this fall that are in maybe the upper threes or low fours, maybe some mm-hmm. pretty skinny minis. I like to use body condition scoring over the summer as sort of to help dictate when we wean so we don't let those cows lactate into a big hole and then we got to feed them out of that but certainly um, um, if we've not weaned yet we should think about that and we should get busy checking body condition score in case we have to do some remediation because we want them about a body condition score five and a half um, at calving time to make sure that those cows as they go through uh, the first part of lactation and in front of the breeding season don't get too thin so we have a bunch of open cows next year and i suspect there'll probably be some uh, issues, you know, as we come through summer um, and preg check this fall, maybe some body condition score issues related to pregnancy and open cows already, and we want to sort of get out of that problem going into next year, so we don't have that carryover effect. So the key is do the body scoring at the time, and you can do it during the summer, as you mentioned. But but right now we're thinking about preg check time, and the maybe reason the is not necessarily time. to assess where they've been. But to plan out what's the nutrition going forward. Going forward, that's right. how are we going to do it through the winter? One of the other pieces that we use there is looking at doing some forage testing, hay testing. This is also a good time of year to do that. So so give me some thoughts on, or is it a good time of year to do that? Yeah, so I, I, I sort of think there's a, there's a whole bunch of these activities kind of line up in terms of the planning for this winter feeding. And part of that certainly... Um, testing and seeing what kind of hay we put up earlier in the year and getting that in advance. So if we need to buy some protein, uh, whether that's co-products or traditional sort of cake products, um, we've got that uh, available and we can plan. And if you've got, you know, there's time to do some tax planning stuff, pre-purchase some of those supplies you might need for next year if you need to, to take care of some tax issues. But getting those forage test done so you've got that information uh, ahead of time can be really valuable and you don't have it, it takes a little while to get those back and so you, this is just a good time of year to you know we got our hay kind of bunkered in for most of us you know fourth cutting alfalfa is just kind of happening right now so figuring out what our hay situation is it's a little tight on this end of the state prices are a little high so thinking about some alternatives to go with some maybe lower quality or crp kind of hay makes a lot of sense so. so look so let me ask you some questions and and we'll just go with some of the some of the kind of standards and these are relatively frequent questions if i've got some prairie hay or a grass hay that i'm used to buying i bought before buying it from the same folks do i need to test it or can i look up the nrc there's book values for that type of hay do I need to test it, or can I just look at the book value? Yeah, I, I, 
I like to test because the the range in crude protein in even prairie hay can vary quite a bit. And the challenge will be if it's high or relatively high, you don't have to supplement as much supplemental protein products, which saves you money. Um, If it's really low, it's important to know that because now all of a sudden, if if you've got low protein in that product, um, not supplementing the cows, they're not going to do as well on it. If you've got a body condition score issue, like we talked earlier, you're not going to get that gain in recovery. Digestibility is going to be poorer than what you expect. And so having the number and knowing what you've got in the end, uh, although it costs a little bit to do hay testing, I've never had a situation where somebody tested hay and got the answer back and says, geez, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, so some of the, the things that I'm most interested in, surprisingly enough, dry matter. I want to make sure I know what dry matter is. And I use that to adjust some of the other things that I'm going to look at. But protein is the best probably number that we've got as far as the most repeatable, most most accurate assessment of the grass. Some of the energy, either TDN or net energy that's reported, those are, um, to me, less accurate in that I think uh, sometimes the reality of how the cattle perform can be a little bit different than what the calculated energy values are. I mean, they're going to be in the ballpark, but they can be a little bit off. Uh, But the protein is really important, and that's telling me a lot about the maturity of the forage when it was harvested. So one of the things you, you guys asked was, do I need to test? Well, the more I know about the forage already, the less I need to test. So if I have experience with a forage source, so a hay field or a pasture that I've, and I've gotten hay from that for many years, and I've gotten forage tests in the past years, and I know how this year's growing condition compares to other years, then I probably don't need to be as in, intense about forage testing. But the reality is a lot of times I don't have that information. I don't have multiple years of, of other test results, and I don't have a good way to correlate it with other growing seasons, you know, the last few years of growing seasons. So it, I, I like to test. I like, I think it provides some really good, valuable information as you're planning it. But then I would also say, based on some experience of, the other thing is let the cows tell you. So start them on the supplementation that you plan. And so if you're going to start supplementing in 1st of December, or late, late December, well then really see what they're doing body condition wise through January. And I may need to increase my supplementation or decreasing it based on what the cows tell me and sometimes the cows tell me something a little different than the forage test told me and the question is you can be a little bit further behind so once the cows are telling you then you may have to play catch up but that's something something to watch and i'd be curious for our listeners send in and let us know i'd be i'd be interested in how many of you do some sort of forage testing we'll also put out a poll and find out and then next week We'll talk some about the costs, some of the specifics. The other question I want to get into is, so, so yeah, we're saying test, but I purchased quite a few bales. How many, testing where? Testing strategies. Testing yep. strategies. So yep. next week, we'll talk more about testing strategies. And I want to hear from you if you test or not and tell us some, some information there. We've got some good topics to follow up on next week, but I would say our, our BCI Cattle Chat mailbox could use some some questions from you so if you have questions that you'd like us to answer or topics you'd like us to address send those in also don't forget if you if you like us you can rate us on itunes we've got a couple other areas that will be coming out soon but share an episode with your friend that's how we how we pass it around and we look forward to visiting with you next week K-State's Brad White, Bob Weber, and Bob Larson. That's just a portion of this week's BCI Cattle Chat podcast. The full version also includes some interesting information from K-State livestock economist Dustin Pendle on beef consumer demographics. You can hear that entire podcast at www.beefcattleinstitute.org. Beefcattleinstitute.org. We'll return in a few moments with more. This is Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. (music) 
Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you as we turn to today's agricultural news headlines for you now, courtesy in part of DTN and beginning with this week's Kansas winter wheat planting and harvest progress report from the USDA for the week ending this past Sunday. Our top soil moisture supplies in the state are at 4% surplus and 79% adequate, only 17% short to very short. Subsoil moisture, 1% surplus and 80% adequate. 19% short to very short. Winter wheat planting in the state, 41% complete now. That's ahead of the five-year average of 32%. And wheat emergence is at 17%, ahead of the 11% average. Corn harvest in Kansas, 47% complete. That's ahead of the 39% average. Soybean harvest at 7%. That's right on the average for the date. And the grain sorghum harvest is 10% complete. Again, that is right on the average. For an account of corn and soybean harvest progress nationally, now we turn to the USDA's Stephanie Ho. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey has the latest on the nation's corn crop. 86% fully mature on September 30th. That remains well ahead of the five-year average of 71% and last year's 66%. He noted the first freeze of the season in the upper Midwest. Primarily affecting North Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And in those states, we saw corn full maturity pretty far along and well ahead of average limiting any potential impacts. And he says as a result of lingering wetness and additional showers. Corn harvest not exactly going gangbusters right now. We do see more than a quarter, 26 percent of the U.S. corn harvested by September 30th. Meanwhile, there's no change in corn condition from last week. 69 percent good to excellent and 12 percent very poor to poor. 83 percent of soybeans are dropping leaves. That's ahead of the five-year average of 75 percent. And last year, 78 percent. Rippey points to an end of September freeze in the upper Midwest. The good news with the advanced progress is that does put a significantly more of the crop out of danger when this freeze occurred. And so we really don't have too many big concerns, despite the fact that we did have our first and season-ending freeze by the end of September in some of the northernmost production areas. He says 23 percent of soybeans have been harvested, compared to a five-year average of 20 percent. Soybean condition for the week ending September 30th, steady at 68 percent, good to excellent, 10 percent, very poor to poor, slightly below last year's end of September number, which was 60 percent, good to excellent, and 12 percent, very poor to poor. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. And more details coming clear on that new United States-Mexico-Canada trade agreement, the replacement for NAFTA, if you will, including potentially more dairy access in Canada and more equal treatment of wheat products shipped north as well. The fact that an agreement has been struck provides some certainty of relief for U.S. dairy farmers, then the old NAFTA would not be broken up. That's according to former USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack, who is now the CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. He said the agreement will need to be studied to determine just how much access U.S. producers will gain because there are so many different dairy products and tariff lines in these trade deals. But he said, quoting Vilsack, there's the possibility of real meaningful market access in Canada, whether it meets the level of expectation the administration set during the negotiations has yet to be determined. In another provision significant for northern wheat producers, U.S. wheat will no longer be branded as feed grain. Once the trade agreement is ratified, Canada will be required to treat imported wheat from the U.S., quoting here, no less favorable than it accords to like wheat of national origin with respect to the assignment of grade qualities. Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of Milk Lines. And standing by, as always, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to talk to our Kansas dairy farmers concerning the size of the heifer herd that you might be running on your current operation. You know, as we look at very tight margins in the dairy industry, one of the ways that we might be able to reduce our cost of production is actually with our heifer program. So one of the things that we might want to consider is how many heifers do you actually need to raise to provide an adequate number of replacements in your dairy herd? You know, with the use of sex semen and better management 
practices that increase the survivability of our heifers, maybe we don't need to necessarily have every animal that calves drop a calf on the ground that's going to be destined for use in the dairy industry. So what am I talking about? Well, a lot of our producers have taken a look at the actual number of heifers they actually need to replace, realizing that with sex semen, they actually have an oversupply of heifers. Sound like a familiar story happening on many of our dairy farms. So if you're not really in a situation where you're trying to expand your dairy farm, is it really profitable to have extra heifers around that you're trying to market? Well, in recent months, many of you probably have realized that that's maybe not the most profitable thing to try to do. So what's some other options? Well, one of the things that many producers are considering doing and actually doing on many farms is they're actually using a little bit of beef semen in the lower end of the herd. In other words, those animals that aren't as high of genetic value in their herd, maybe you take the bottom 20%, 25%. It really depends on what is the size of the heifer herd that you actually need for replacements. Those animals on the bottom end are bred to beef semen. Those animals then, when they calve, those calves are very valuable in the beef industry. It doesn't really make any difference whether they're bulls or heifers when they drop. They're 50% beef and can be very important in the food supply around the United States and actually across the world. So if you have a Holstein herd, Angus probably is the breed of choice for that cross. If you're running jerseys, sometimes folks will choose limousine to make that cross. Again, it just gives us an animal that's very marketable in the beef industry, reduces the total supply of heifers that we have in our industry that might be used for dairy purposes, and it can reduce our production costs. Keep in mind that if you actually look at the cost of raising a heifer, every heifer that you have on the farm is probably costing you somewhere between $700 and $850 each year. So by the time that animal is actually raised through calving, through a two-year process, that may be somewhere between $1,400 and $1,700. So on an annual basis, it really does add up. Can you reduce the size of your heifer herd by 10%, 15%? Well, if you can, that's a significant savings, regardless of the size of your dairy farm. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to carefully calculate how many dairy heifers we actually need to raise to provide replacements in our dairy herds. All right, Mike, many thanks. K-State's Charlie Lee awaits for his weekly visit with us here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today is back now as we talk once again with Charlie Lee. He's a wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension, as you know. A closer examination this time around, Charlie, of one of the five venomous snakes we find in Kansas, the copperhead. And it's fairly easy to discover in the state, right? Yeah, the copperhead is fairly large. Uh, you can get up to 40 inches in length. They're heavy-bodied snakes uh, with elliptical eye pupils, cat eyes, if you will. The coloration uh, is tan to brown with hourglass-shaped crossbands down the length of the body. Most snakes that are confused for copperheads have blotches and not the complete band that is shown in copperheads. The head is solid brown. Um, they're actually very common in Kansas from the eastern border over to I-135 uh, uh, and then on up north along Highway 81. I don't believe there are any records from copperheads further west in Kansas than that. So although they are a, a venomous species, uh, a pit viper, they rarely cause a human mortality but they are a species that's responsible for more bites than many of the others. But when you think about how many snakes there are across the United States and how many people 
are bitten each year, the likelihood of you being bitten by a venomous uh, reptile in Kansas is very low. Only about seven to 8,000 people uh, each year in the U.S. are bitten. There were 23 mortalities in the last eight years from venomous snakes in, uh, in the United States, and only three of those came from copperhead bites. Uh, when you dig into that a little bit further, of those three people that were bitten by copperheads, one of those individuals died from a heart attack that was induced by the, uh, the bite. Another one had anaphylactic shock that caused the, the death. And the third actually died from the toxins uh, inveminated by the copperhead. You say that the copperhead's venom is less potent than that of other venomous snakes? Yeah, I think that has to be the conclusion since that there are more copperheads uh, bite people than uh, the other species of venomous snakes that we have in the United States, and it's um, the fewest number of mortalities. For comparison, there were 16 out of that 23 that died from rattlesnake bites. But there's a lot of people that are concerned about that particular aspect of venomous snakes, and copperheads are very colorful, and people tend to, to collect, want to touch, and handle those. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that some of the, these individuals are getting bitten. Besides, copperheads are fairly common across the eastern part of the United States. So one of the take-homes is leave them alone, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, I, I think that's probably a great, great message. Uh, if they're not in a place where they're causing significant risk, like in a home, uh, leave them alone. They're going to find a way to go on about their home range and, and find the habitat that uh, best suits them. Now, there's been recent research on their predatory habits and how they actually track and feed on their prey. Talk about that a bit. Well, there was a publication uh, done at the University of Kansas that looked at prey scent uh, stimuli on the predatory behavior of copperheads. The senses of taste and smell are certainly very important tools, if you will, that copperheads use to, to hunt and to survive. Uh, they rely on that chemoreception for behaviors like feeding, predator avoidance, uh, reproduction, orientation, aggression. All of those rely on their ability to taste and to smell. So this particular research report looked at how copperheads followed prey that they struck and inveminated for foraging. And actually it found that although copperheads here in Kansas primarily feed on mammals, there are distinct dietary preferences depending upon where in the United States the copperhead comes from. For instance, this study looked at copperheads that were collected in Louisiana. Those copperheads primarily fed on frogs. They looked at another population of copperheads from Texas that primarily fed on insects. So this study tried to determine how the, the copperheads followed prey after they struck those prey items and did they use the scent of the prey or did they use the smell of the invimination that allowed them to follow the prey. And I guess the latter was what was uh, determined in this particular research, that they actually found the prey primarily after it had been inveminated, and they used those senses rather than the, the smells and taste of the prey that perhaps was struck and not inveminated. Copperheads, when they're striking frogs and insects, often don't release the prey, so they may not have to follow it very far. They've actually got it kept in grasp, but often when vipers, including copperheads, strike rodents, they inveminate the rodent to let it go and then follow the rodent later in order to avoid being hurt by their prey before they succumb. Interesting predatory traits. And lastly, we're into fall now. It's cooling down ever so gradually, so copperheads should be eventually moving into hibernation, should they not? Well, most of our snakes are need to get uh, somewhere in cover that's going to keep the temperature above 50 degrees. So when it gets uh, soil temperatures get below 50 degrees, they're usually going to have to go a little bit below ground. 
And the further north you are in the state, probably the deeper uh, they're going to have to go in order to maintain that kind of minimum body temperature. Most of those times they're going to be in rodent burrows or runways. As it gets colder, they're going to have to find deeper burrows. And again, somewhat depending upon the the type of year we're having, those depths in some places in Kansas may approach greater than four feet in depth before we get to those type of temperatures. So this is the time of year. There's a lot of movement by snakes, primarily because of the wide swings in temperatures. Copperheads will come out during the daytime to warm up. They may uh, go down below ground somewhat during the nocturnal times. This time here in the fall, it's probably going to be out more frequently during the warmer part of the day. Well, hopefully what Charlie's provided today will make you more familiar with the copperhead and its tendencies. And Charlie, we appreciate the overview right here. Many thanks. Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Our time's away for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.